In this theory session, we're going to talk about untangling the wires. So to review from before, Spanish has a finite set of distinct elemental sounds. And to learn these sounds, you need to be able to map them to the motor sensory sensations in your speech organ. And to help that mapping process, you can also map these sound sensations to sights and symbols or bring your eyes into the mix. Um, so if you remember this slide from before, when I talked about learning the violin, I would use my eyes to see my fingers and I use that to adjust my hearing of the sound and whatnot. And, um, and then also it's the same thing for speaking. I can use the visual of the graphics and whatnot to adjust my pronunciation and my hearing there as well. So it's a similar thing we're talking about here, but we're going to get a bit more in detail. So let's talk about a guitar, for example. Um, if you wanted to learn the guitar, you, you need to learn how to put your fingers on the guitar board. So similar as before, you're mapping the sound you create bring, with the sensation on your fingers and the movements of your fingers. Now, um, you can look at someone's hand and try to mimic what they're doing there. Uh, but to make things simpler for people, they've created these things called guitar grids, right? So this is like a geometric abstract representation of what that person is actually the exact same chord the person is playing in this picture right here and it's showing you where to put your fingers so one means your first finger two, your second finger etc and then those are the strings there and then you see the frets as well uh, so what this is is a symbolic representation of what the guitar player is doing with his hand and there's only so many ways you can configure your fingers on a guitar board. So you can give those a distinct symbol or name. So for example, this is called the C major chord on a guitar. Um, so the same thing happens with language, right? So this sound, right? That's the actual thing I'm seeing when someone's making that sound. Uh, but as we discussed before, what goes on in the mouth for pronunciation is mostly beyond what we can see. It's going on behind your teeth and we can't really access it. Uh, so we use these visualizations, these abstract geometric simplifications to represent what's going on in the mouth. So in the previous um, lessons, you learned how the sound, for example, is made by placing your lower lip against your upper teeth. And since we don't wanna use these images all the time when we're trying to communicate, uh, we can simplify it even more, same as we do with the C major, and we'll call this one the F. And in phonetics, we use that side bracket to indicate that the symbol we're using in between is a phonetic symbol. It's a symbol for an elemental sound, right? So that is the same process here. We start with the, you know, the complex reality that's not too easy to work with. We reduce that down to like a geometric abstract symbolization. We can reduce that down even further to a simple kind of squiggle on a paper. And then we just agree that for now on, whenever you see that symbol, we're referring to this sensation and this sound. So what this shows is that symbols can make things simple. Symbols can make things simple. That's why we use them. Uh, however, symbols, the key word there is also can, because symbols can also make things complicated if not done properly. So to give you an example, uh, these four symbols here in the English language, in our English, what they call orthography, orthographical system, or just writing system, the H is a H, the G is a G, U is a U, and the O is a O, right? H-G-U-O, you would have that first association when you see them like that, right? But if I put these together and put a T-H in front, you wouldn't say O, U, G, you'd say though, right? Not to mention, by the way, that the T and the H separately would be t but somehow it's a the when they're together, and I have the. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll just learn that O-U-G-H. When they go together, I make the O sound. Except when I put a T at the end, it's not though, it's thought, right? And if I get rid of that T and put an R in between, I have through. So now I went from O to all the O. And if I get rid of anything and put a T, it's tough, uh, uff, with an F in there somehow as well. So very confusing, right? The same 
four letter symbol, the same visualization is representing very different sounds. And I wanted to map that out. I'd say, okay, here are my four symbols, O, U, G, H. As we discussed, the O is an O, and that's how we say it in English, O. U is an U, is an U. a G is a G, and the H is an H, right? But now we have this O, U, G, H, which in the case of though, can be the O sound. In the case of through, it can be the O sound. In the case of thought, we now add a new sound, ah, that's an ah sound. Now this ah sound isn't only captured by the O-U-G-H, it's also sometimes written uh, with the letter O. So for example, dog, ah, is the same ah from thought, ah, ah, dog, right? And that's written D-O-G. Um, and this O-U-G-H can also make this uh sound as it does in rough, right? Uh, and that uh, can also be represented by the letter U, as in under, right? So these things all get crossed very complexly in, 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 in a way that if you're an English learner, your life would be very difficult. So I hope you have sympathy now. This is just one small sliver of the English language. And the English language has a very interesting history to it in terms of its writing system. You know, the French conquered England for several centuries, and then many of our words come from French, and then we didn't really have a revamp of the spelling system. So that's why you have all these weird different kind of ways of spelling the same thing. Um, and in Spanish, it's not that much of a um, confusion. You know, for the most part, things map easily in Spanish, not nowhere near as complicated as English. However, there is still some places where it gets complicated. For example, the letter G in Spanish. And you might say, oh, easy, G means G, right? But as we discussed in previous lessons, there's not just one G sound. There's also a soft L sound. So I could say uh, Hu Go, or I can say Hu Ro, Ro, Go. These are two different sounds, and it's important for you to learn both of them and be able to hear and distinguish both of them, the soft one from the hard one, right? And you say, okay, fine, well, letter G has a hard version and a soft version. Easy to remember, right? Uh, except that the letter G can also make a H sound. For example, in the word gimnasio, you spell gimnasio with the letter G. So the G can mean a G or it can mean a H. And you say, oh, okay, well, what do we do about that? In the Spanish language and the spelling system, the way they deal with that is they write uh, G-U. So if it's, for example, uh, guerra, G-U-E-R-R-A. And the reason why they do that is because if there was no U, you might pronounce it gera. So you might do that little h sound instead. So okay, new rule, put a G U in there and then that way we know it's a G. But you know, once again, it could also be a l, so let's put another thing there. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, this h sound isn't just represented by the letter G, it's also represented by the letter J, like in Jorge and Javier, right? And then we think, oh wait, this is also a dialectal sound, depending on my accent, I might say Javier and Jorge, in which case the sound needs to also be mapped to the J. And then just to make things that much more complicated, uh, the letter G, of course, can come down to a H, so it's gimnasio. And then also this letter X, you'll find if you go to Latin America or like Mexico, for example, you have like Jochimilco and stuff like that. And the letter X can also represent the H. So what I'm showing here is that even in Spanish, it can be very complicated when we have just these small group of letters to work with. So what's going on here is we're dealing with a many-to-many -many organization. This is a technical term which says that if we have um, these things on the left and these triangles on the right, instead of having um, you know one for one, each one of these things can represent many different triangles and each triangle can meet many different circles. So that's what a many-to-many -many connection is. And as you can see, many-to-many -many is complicated. What's simple is a one-to-one. -one. In a one-to-one, -one, what's going on is, you know, for every, there's this circle here, and no matter what, this circle always represents this triangle. And circle number two always represents triangle number two, right? And what's going on here is um, there's no crossing of the wires. Everything is nice and cleanly untangled, and that means there's no confusion. You don't have to learn all the different exceptions and scenarios and all those kind of details. So the International Phonetic Alphabet 
which is what we've been using so far in this course when you see the transcriptions, uh, with a few modifications that I put in there to make things even more sensical for you. Uh, IPA is a one-to-one -one system for mapping symbols to sounds. So when I say and I write the letter F, what we're saying in IPA is that when you see the letter F, it's only going to represent and when you hear the sound it's only going to be represented by the letter F and there's not going to be any other random symbols and exceptions, right? So when you learn IPA, it makes things clear in your mind and as a result, it makes things clear in your ear. And people resist learning IPA because they're like, oh, it's so confusing. They see those symbols they've never seen before and they think to themselves, oh, it's a super technical and super complicated. And in reality, um, it's not that difficult. In fact, you probably already know 90% of it just by passive exposure in this course so far. And um, also, it doesn't take long to learn new associations and symbols. But once you do, things get cleared up in your mind. And that's very important because now when you listen to things, it just comes in. So just trust me on this one. When you learn these things, even if it's an initial learning curve, it pays off hugely in the end. So the way you're gonna learn IPA in this lesson, we have three practice sessions and where each of them focuses on one aspect of the mapping. So like always, we start with the sound, the most important thing. And the first thing you're gonna map is the sound to the name. So for example, if I have the B sound, it would give you the name voiced bilabial fricative. Once again, these names are intimidating to people, but they shouldn't be because all they're doing is just stating what the features are. You already learned what the features were in module four and why it's important to know those because of the boundaries of your perception. And um, so you'll see in a coaching session as well as in your practice sessions how to do that. Super useful, it gives you the ability to critically think. So when you hear a sound like shh, and you say to yourself, well, I hear the sound shh, I mimic it, I feel the sensation in my mouth, I can visualize what's going on in my mouth, shh, and then I ask myself the question, okay, What's this called? Is it voiced or voiceless? Shh. Oh, it's voiceless. And then I say, um, well, what, where am I making it? Shh. Well, it's, you know, this part of my tongue against this part, you know, just beyond my alveolar ridge. So it would be post alveolar or palatal alveolar, um, whatever the place is. And then you say, how is the airflow? What's the manner? Shh. Well, it's a continuous. My articulators are touching. Therefore, it's a fricative, right? So you're not memorizing names here. Uh, what you're doing is you're learning how to critically think through the features and then that once again really solidifies and, and grounds the mapping in your mind. So that's the first thing you're going to do. It's probably the most challenging of the, of the three things. Um, after that, much simpler, this is a memorization game. You're just um, mapping the sound to the symbol, right? So for example, the, the v sound, voice by Lego fricative, V, v, that's the symbol for it on the bottom right there. And once you have that, then it's just kind of the close the loop, mapping the symbol to the name. Um, once you have that, then you know everything's kind of tightly geared in your mind. So to review then, when symbolic systems are many to many, they make things complicated, such as the normal writing system in English and Spanish. But when these systems are one to one, they make things simpler as is the case with IPA. So by learning IPA, you are clarifying the maps in your mind and further strengthening your listening frame. So have fun with this when you do these sessions. The goal here is to be able to go through and feel comfortable with every symbol, every name, and every sound. And you're also rehashing, you're revising all the things and synthesizing all the things you've learned in um, the previous lessons of this module, as well as module four. So have fun with that. Let us know if you have any questions.